is Michael. I'm a member of the National Committee of the Communist Party, uh, originally from Ohio and uh, relocated to New York a couple years ago, where I recently worked as um, a member of the National Office. And so I'm very excited uh, for this presentation, and it's an honor to be here with you all celebrating uh, Women's History Month. So thank you for having me. So happy International Women's Day. Not too late to wish everyone that. And happy uh, Women's History Month. We're still in the month of March, and so we keep on celebrating. And so why are we emphasizing the role of trans women in the struggle for democracy and, uh, democracy and socialism? Trans women are a part of our working class. It's that simple, right? Our working class is diverse. It's multiracial. It's multigender. Um, and trans women are a significant part of the working class. They're not isolated from any of the struggles uh, facing all other workers. You know, trans women face racism, they face sexual harassment, they face discrimination on the job, they face, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the recent right wing attacks on um, them being able to use the, the bathroom of their choice and so forth. And so trans women therefore face a special kind of oppression, kind of like when we think about racism. Um, you know, not white workers and black workers, although they both suffer oppression, they're both oppressed uh, 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 people under uh, capitalism, black workers uh, face special forms of oppression that aren't faced by white workers, just because that's the history of the country and that's the way capitalism works in this country. Same thing goes for trans people, uh, particularly trans women. You know, the homicide rates for trans women are up, um, especially particularly uh, trans women of color, black and brown trans women. And they obviously face um, uh, special forms of oppression that not even members of other members of the LGBTQ uh, community face, you know, gay men, lesbian women, and so forth. And so why should the Communist Party care about this as an organizational issue? Well, nearly a third of the applicants and attendees of our uh, 2021 uh, Marxist Youth School, which took place in New York City, we called it the Little Red Schoolhouse, took place last July and to the beginning of August. Um, we had 116 uh, applicants to that school, and nearly a third of them, a third of them identified as being somewhere on the non-binary spectrum, you know, not identifying as uh, cisgender woman, cisgender male, or um, they identified as members of the LGBTQ community, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, and so forth. And so it's important. We can't just brush this aside. You know, this is our working class. We only have one working class to deal with. And so, you know, it, de it deserves our attention uh, uh, to, uh, to pay attention to this matter. Also, we can't, it goes without saying, but we have to say it, um, some complaints were made um, last year about a lack of inclusive language and conversation and debate around the issues um, concerning uh, uh, transgender members of our party and so forth. And this ultimately led to the passing of a document uh, by the national board in January of this year, which CJ will get to uh, later. And this is a picture of uh, many of the attendees of our 2021 uh, Marxist Youth School in New York uh, last July. I also want to uh, reiterate, you know, it goes, sometimes it gets glazed over in everyday conversation or when we're talking about pop culture, but working class black and brown trans women found in modern pop culture, you know, anywhere from what we may consider as uh, petty bourgeois pop music or lingo and so forth. You know, this actually came from working class black and brown trans women in the ballroom community. Now, the ballroom community is an underground, again, working class, mostly black and brown trans women uh, community that was founded in New York, uh, late 60s, early 70s, of um, trans women who were, you know, kicked out of their homes, rejected by their families, and took to the, the profession of sex work to, uh, to survive because, you know, and especially at that time, there were not laws in place uh, protecting not only uh, gays and lesbians, but particularly trans women, trans women of color. They couldn't get a job. They couldn't walk into a pharmacy or a restaurant and get a job. It was, you know, very hard to, to get to seek legal employment at that time. And so they would wander the piers of uh, the West Village, the Christopher Street piers, and they would find other trans women or even young uh, gay men, young lesbians and so forth, and they would form houses. And these were adopted families where these people would live together and they would compete in uh, dances and uh, modeling performances and so forth within the LGBTQ community. And they would imitate, uh, you know, the everyday mainstream uh, weather woman or student or businessman, what they thought they could never aspire to be out in the mainstream white world. 
and th they rose to prominence in their community. And it has recently received attention in mainstream culture on programs such as Pose on Netflix, you can watch that, Legendary, another one on, on HBO Max that you can add to your viewing list. And so, for example, Madonna, everyone knows Madonna, you know, mainstream, petty bourgeois pop music, whatever you want to call it. Her song Vogue, the dance style Vogue, that came from black and brown trans women, right? And so it had that song not been made, you know, in the early 90s, which, you know, rose to the charts. I think it, there was also a MTV um, award show where she opened with that song. You know, that would not have been possible without um, the work and the sacrifices of uh, black and brown trans women. I also... Um, uh, interviewed a few of these women and a few of the uh, the men who were taken into their homes as a result of the ballroom community on peoplesworld.org. So you can go and check out those articles. I wrote them last year um, for Pride Month, so last June. So I hope you can enjoy those. Another thing that often gets glazed over is in, in our discussions around um, gay liberation. You know, everyone's familiar with the, the Hollywood film Milk about Harvey Milk. You know, he was the first um, elected openly gay man as an alderman in San Francisco, um, was originally a Republican and then became a Democrat. You know, he's he's known for, you know, leading the gay community into the, the let's say, the modern era of contemporary LGBTQ rights. And of course, Harry Hay, you know, a former member of our party as well. CJ's done great work uh, in his research of Harry Hay. But we tend to glaze over the, the leading roles that trans women of color like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera played in the Stonewall riots and in the, the struggle for LGBTQ liberation. And so that's something um, that deserves more attention. They weren't members of the party, but they were certainly left. They certainly believed in socialism and they played leading roles in the overall struggle for uh, democracy and socialism in this country. And so I, as a gay man, want to take this time uh, to thank uh, these trans women and other trans women, you know, who have passed or who are still around um, and I want to thank them for leading this struggle because I feel like you all don't get enough um, attention and gratitude, you know, from from everyone in our community um, for all the hard work that you did. So we appreciate it. Thank you. And this isn't something of the past. Trans women continue to lead the struggle for democracy and socialism all over the world, not just here in the United States. And if we start with Georgina B uh, Bayer, so she is an Aborigine woman uh, from uh, New Zealand. Um, she's a former sex worker. She was a, a member of the Labour Party of New Zealand, considers herself a socialist, and she was the first openly trans woman uh, who served as a member of parliament in the world, and that was from 1999 to 2005. Then we have uh, Vladimir Lukuria. She's a member of the Communist uh, Refoundation Party of Italy, which was born out of, out of the old um, uh, Italian Communist Party, which collapsed in 1991 as a result of, you know, Euro-communism and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, she helped refound uh, that party, uh, the Communist Party of Italy, and went on to serve in the Italian Congress as a congresswoman from 2006 to 2008. Then we have Anna Grodzka. She uh, was a member of the parliament in Poland, a very conservative country, very conservative country worth noting. And she served um, as a member of, the, of, of uh, the parliament in Poland as a member of the Polish Socialist Party from 2011 to 2015. Finally, we have Amelia Schneider, only 25 years old. Um, she was elected in November uh, 2021 as a member of Congress in Chile. Uh, she's a part of the new progressive left-leaning government in coalition with the Communist Party and the new president, Gabriel Boric, big leadership of uh, former student activists and so forth. She's a member of the Communes Party and uh, was just this past week nominated to be on the feminist um, feminist and public education co uh, commissions in Congress. And so that's a huge, huge development coming out of Latin America, you know, a country which used to be under the fascist dictatorship of Pinochet and um, recently just experienced the student led uh, protests and revolts that took place since 2019. And so this is a result of, of that uprising, you know, and trans women are a part of that, playing leading roles. Another thing is I don't want people to walk away from this presentation thinking that all trans women are, you know, radical leftists, um, you know, members of the Communist Party and so forth. Obviously, that's not the that's not the truth. Um, and although we may not agree with all trans women and their uh, political ideologies and so forth, it's worth noting that representation does matter. And as I mentioned before, trans women are a significant portion of our working class and they're on all parts. All they fall on all sides of the, of the uh, political spectrum. And so in the case of Rachel Levine, 
Um, she was uh, nominated to be Assistant Secretary for Health in the Department of Health and Human Services by uh, President Biden. Um, and that would make her the first openly trans uh, federal official confirmed by the Senate by a vote of 52 to 48 as of March of last year. And she had previously served as a Pencil, uh, Pennsylvania Secretary of Health um, which I mean, she had to take on the, the COVID crisis, right, before she was nominated to this position. And so that's a significant role that she's playing. And then we also have Nikki Sinclair. Nikki Sinclair, not uh, in line with our politics at all, um, served as a member of British Parliament from 2019 to 2014 as a member of the UK Independence Party. So to the right of the Conservative Party. You know, I want to emphasize that trans women are on all sides of the political spectrum. They're not all radical leftists. And she went on to uh, found her own party called the We Demand a Referendum Party, uh, which led kind of a right wing effort um, for the uh, for Great Britain to leave the European Union. And so the fight for equality continues, you know, with all this in mind, we have to consider that we have to um, include these uh, trans comrades joining our ranks um, into our circles. We have to use inclusive language. We have to uh, remember that they are a significant part of our working class, and they're also leaders of our working class. They're leading these struggles uh, for equality, uh, democracy, socialism, peace, and so forth. And so it's not something that we can see ourselves isolated from. And without further ado, I want to introduce the next speaker, Comrade Shea. Hi, my name is Shea. My pronouns are they, them. I'm non-binary. I'm a trans communist member here and um, I'm also a nurse. I'm a nurse educator for a transgender health program. So I get to talk about these issues a lot and I'm gonna talk with you about a few issues here. All right, let me get this started. Wanna do a clean screen? There you are. There mm -hmm. All right, so um, first we'll start with a few definitions uh, so everybody knows we're talking about the same thing. Transgender is somebody whose sex assigned at birth and gender identity differs. A non-binary person like myself is somebody whose gender is not exclusively man or woman, it could be something else, and they can be from any sex assigned at birth. Gender dysphoria is a medical condition that many trans people have. You don't have to have it to be trans, but it is a medical condition. And transitioning is the process of aligning parts of your life with your gender. It could be taking hormones, doing surgery, it could just be changing your name. So my brief presentation, we're going to talk about what trans people are, who they are, what is transphobia, what kind of conditions do they live in, and what you can do. So who are trans people. Well, trans people make up about 1% of the population, so it's a very small minority group. About one-third are trans women, a third are trans men, and slightly more than a third are non-binary. And proportionately, there's slightly more BIPOC uh, trans people than white people, uh, white trans people. So it's a, they represent a higher percentage in the trans community than they do in the cisgender community. So what is transphobia? Uh, many people think it's the irrational fear or hatred of trans people. So because they view it as an irrational fear or hatred, they may not think that they're transphobic. But I define it as the denial or refusal to believe that trans people are the gender they say they are. And that will make sense when we talk about the next section, the material conditions. So. Uh, with this model of transphobia about refusing to believe them and their gender, we have, like, uh, individually, people will experience lower uh, so levels of social support, um, increased unemployment, increased homelessness, and many other things, right? These happen because people don't believe trans people are their gender, and collectively, this causes the community to experience a number of negative outcomes. We're going to talk about, briefly talk about three of them. The first is economics, the second is sexual violence, and the third is healthcare. All these are very important issues to communists, and all these are important issues to feminists, and they tie together in the struggle for trans rights. So with economics, um, in 2015, 
the U.S. Transgender Survey came out and it showed that 15% of trans people are unemployed and 29% lived in poverty, right? In 2020, a study by the CDC showed that 63% of trans people were living below the federal poverty line of $12,880. So in a period of uh, five years, a significant increase in poverty occurred. That same study showed that uh, if they had HIV, the poverty rate, um, the homeless rate went up to 42% from 13%. So huge amounts of uh, immi economic immiseration occurred. And then with pay gap uh, in 2021, it's estimated to be about 22.1% for cisgender women, meaning they make about 88 cents on the dollar that men make. For LGBTQ cis women, that's 87 cents on the dollar, so slightly less. For transgender men, it's 70 cents on the dollar, and for trans women, it's 60 cents on the dollar. And that same report concluded that trans women um, made the least amount of any group of people, with the exception of disabled people who are on disability. So with sexual violence, it's a perversive problem in our society, and we know it starts early. And trans girls and trans feminine people experience significantly elevated rates of childhood sexual assault and rape. Uh, one study showed that um, people were assigned female at birth, regardless of if they're cisgender girls, transgender men, or trans masculine non-binary people, they had about the same rate of childhood sexual abuse and rape. But what they found was that for trans girls, and trans feminine non-binary people, they experienced significantly elevated rates of childhood sexual abuse at 37.9 and 39%, and significantly elevated rates of childhood rape at 31% for trans girls and 21.4% for trans feminine non-binary people. So it's a drastic elevation of rape in kids. And we see the same thing for adults, especially for transgender women of color, they face catastrophic rates of sexual assault and rape. So the 2015 survey found that 47% of transgender women are raped at least once in their lifetime. And that compares to 14.8% of lifetime incidents of rape for cisgender women. Now, this is specifically um, the statistic on rape, it does not include other forms of sexual assault. So those numbers go up for both groups of people, but this is a dramatically elevated uh, incidence of rape. And when accessing domestic violence shelters, transgender women face a high level of rape again, 26% face sexual violence when they go to the domestic violence shelter. But it rises to 50% for indigenous trans women that get sexually assaulted when they go to a domestic violence shelter, and a third of Black and Latina women face the same fate. And transgender women are disproportionately forced into sex work compared to cis women. So it's difficult to estimate this, but one recent study showed 37.9% of trans women worked in the sex industry, and that's compared to an estimated 1% of cisgender women globally working in the sex industry. And finally, with healthcare, um, one great thing is that gender affirming healthcare is it's one of the best types of healthcare that people can get today. It has the highest uh, improvements in quality of life, there are virtually no complications, and it's pretty cheap. So it's a really great type of healthcare to do. However, last year and this year, over 200 bills have been introduced to criminalize gender affirming care, largely targeting transgender youth. In 2015, the Trans Health Survey showed that 1.6% of trans women had HIV. And in a 2020 report from the CDC, that number increased to 42%, so a dramatic increase. In fact, that's a 3,000% increase. That report showed that 65% of indigenous trans women, 62% of black trans women, and 35% of Latina trans women um, also had HIV. Uh, and this study took a look at long-term um, early mortality. So what's your risk of dying early? And this came out of Amsterdam. And uh, on the left, 
you could see transgender women and they're in red and their chance of dying away was dramatic. It was a 2.2 2 to 2.8 times the risk of early death compared to cisgender people. For transgender men, it was a 1.2 to 1.8 time the risk of early death. So it really says it all. This was a much more equal society in Amsterdam than the US. And given all that, people still die early because of discrimination. And finally, what can you do about this? Um, you can become educated on trans issues. You can read about trans people, their problems and what happens to them. You can be radically and explicitly inclusive. Make sure that you are explicitly including transgender people in your actions. Uh, include trans people in your activism and your work as a priority. Organize against the wave of transphobic bills sweeping the nation that could include doing public political education campaigns or remotely supporting these efforts by helping to organize and present them online. You should also work with LGBTQ organizations to advance the Equality Act. And lastly, um, I encourage you to mentor your transgender comrades and help them develop leadership skills so they feel welcome in the party, so they feel welcome in your life. And I want to leave you with this quote. Uh, it says, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you do, and I will tell you what you believe. I try to live my life like that, and I think we should live our life like that, particularly when it comes to issues of oppression. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it off to CJ. All right, thank you very much, Shay. Uh, my name is CJ Atkins. Uh, I'm the managing editor of People's World, and I kind of got my start as an activist uh, a long time ago in the anti-war and the LGBTQ liberation movements. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to you from Singapore today, so my, my internet is not always the most reliable. I've asked Shay to help me control uh, the slides for my section of the presentation. So uh, I'll just be indicating next slide here and there throughout my talk. So uh, that's, that's just a signal to Shay. All right, now uh, for this section, we're going to switch gears uh, just a bit and talk a bit more about the political specifics uh, of the trans and LGBTQ struggle as we move toward the 2022 midterms. You know, a new record was set in 2021 when it comes to the filing of anti-trans leg legislation. With, uh, by the count, I came up with more than 140 different bills put forward by right-wing lawmakers in at least 34 different states. Uh, from Hawaii to Alaska, Texas to Maine, Republicans were on a full court press to target trans people, especially, as Shay mentioned, uh, trans youth and specifically trans female student athletes. Now, only a handful of the proposals from last year managed to pass state legislative sessions uh, uh, before they ended. But that hasn't bothered the Republicans because they've ramped up their effort to use ignorance and hate for political gain even more in 2022. The bills that didn't make it last time are back, along with several uh, even crueler ones. Next slide. Now, places like Florida and Texas are getting the most attention in headlines right now, but the measures that, that they've been implementing in those states are really just the tip of the iceberg. And 2022 is already shaping up uh, to be even worse than last year. And by the numbers I could come across, there are at least right now 170 separate anti-LGBTQ bills currently being considered by state legislatures. And we're only in the month of March. Next slide. But why now? Why is it that Republicans are unleashing this campaign of hate and division that's targeting trans people like nothing that we've ever seen before? What's special about this moment? Next slide. Well, part of it is, is of course, typical political reaction. As LGBTQ people and trans people in particular have become more assertive in demanding their rights to exist, to be recognized, to be treated equally, there's been a conservative uh, backlash brewing for several years. But, but the takeaway thing to, to, to realize is that it goes well beyond that. Next slide. Taking inspiration from the 2004 anti-gay marriage uh, strategy that Republican strategist Karl Rove used to, re -engine, uh, to engineer the re-election of George W. Bush, Republicans right now in state after state 
are planning to do a rerun of that strategy for current times. They're making transphobia a centerpiece of their midterm election efforts in 2022. And just like the right-wing strategists of the past, most of today's bigotry peddling Republican politicians don't actually give a damn about the fundamentalist ignorance that, that motivates a lot of transphobia. But whether they believe in it or not doesn't really matter uh, because the consequences can be quite real. And transgender Americans are just the latest oppressed group to be demonized by the right wing for the sake of votes and for the sake of power. Next slide. There's a whole cast of characters who, who are eager to take on leading roles in this. Uh, one of them is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He's hoping to be a big player when it comes to the 2024 presidential election. Uh, and he's put himself out front in the anti-trans offensive. Last June, he signed a bill that forbids trans girls from playing sports on public school teams alongside uh, athletes who were born as girls. And now, with the, the don't say gay bill in that state, which forbids teachers from, from even mentioning LGBTQ equality in the classroom, DeSantis and Republicans in Florida are using some of the same tactics that they've used uh, under, under the cover of uh, trying to restrict critical race theory. Some of those same tactics are being used to ban teaching uh, about queer people. The formula is the same, whether it's the, the racist uh, critical race theory attacks or the don't say gay bill education uh, attacks. The formula is the same, strip oppressed people of the knowledge about their own oppression and shield others from exposure to the truth. In Texas, under Governor Greg Abbott, the very simple uh, act of parents trying to provide gender affirming care for their trans children, it's been outlawed and declared child abuse. Now, thankfully a judge has, has put an injunction on that bill and it's on hold for now, but it's being copied in, in several other states with right-wing legislatures, uh, legislators coming up and drafting their own, their own versions of it. At the national level, people like former White House occupant Donald Trump are also uh, inserting themselves into the rush to villainize trans people and their supporters. At every political conference or fundraising event, he gets the chance to speak. Lately, Trump has been talking about how Democrats are destroying women's sports. Now, a lot of these politicians will never, you'll never hear them even mention the word transgender, because that would mean acknowledging the reality of, of trans persons. Uh, but the effect of their, their actions is still just the same. Now, although girl sports is, is one of the primary fronts in this culture war that the GOP is, is trying to execute, as we've seen and as we've been hearing, uh, the attacks extend into many, many more areas. And in one locale after another, you're seeing these, these bills being pushed by right-wing extremist groups that have very big money behind them. Organizations like the Heritage Foundation, the Eagle Forum, uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a designated hate group, and there are several others, and they have big money behind them. Next slide. Now, these are all just a sampling of what's been called the War on 100 Fronts, which is this unprecedented avalanche of anti-LGBTQ bills that don't really address any substantive problems. And they're not bills that are being requested by, by these politicians' constituents. Instead, it's an effort that's being driven by national far-right organizations who are partnering with politicians who just want to score votes through fear and hate. But as we heard through Shay's presentation specifically, you know, the, the real world consequences in the lived reality of trans people can be catastrophic. And that's especially the case for trans youth. Next slide. <clears throat> but there is good news. We don't want to just uh, focus on the negative. Uh, despite how it may feel at times, the people of this country, by and large, do not back the Republicans' anti-trans crusade. And what Republicans don't seem to understand is that opposing equality, even if it scores them votes in the short term, is highly unpopular in the long term. The, the Human Rights Campaign, which is one of the leading mainstream LGBTQ uh, uh, civil rights organizations, did a, a poll of 10 swing states, so 10 of the crucial election battlegrounds in late 2020. And what they found was that 87% of respondents 
said that transgender people should have access to medical, equal access to medical care. And maybe one surprising thing was that even among Trump voters in those swing states, 60% said that transgender people at minimum should be able to live openly and freely. And when people were asked about where they rank the importance of banning transgender people from sports, it came in dead last in every one of those states. In not a single one did more than 3% uh, of people say that was at the top of their list. Next slide. So this dangerous and divisive wedge issue has to be taken off the table. And that means that solidarity and support for the trans community has to be a focal point of struggles now and in the immediate future. And even though we are seeing these record numbers of new anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans bills, it is worth noting that there are at least 67 pro-LGBTQ protection bills also working their way through, through state legislatures right now. Now, in addition to fighting against anti-trans laws and fighting for protections at the state level, pressure has to be increased on Congress to pass the Equality Act, which is the same bill that, that Shea mentioned. It's federal legislation that would guarantee explicit and consistent anti-discrimination protection for LGBTQ people in employment, housing, credit, education, access to public services, you name it. It's already passed the House, but it remains to be taken up by the Senate. So uh, uh, an action item that everyone should, should take away is contacting your senator. Tell them to pass the Equality Act right now. If you're in a Communist Party or a YCL club, make the Equality Act part of your 2022 elections work. And speaking of that, we all need to be working right now on voter registration, planning our get out the vote efforts uh, for the midterms and the state votes, because the elections are already underway in a lot of states. And if our side doesn't outmobilize the right wing, they will beat us and more of these bills will become law. Next slide. In too many places, trans people right now are living in an environment where politicians have declared it's open season on their lives, that they don't deserve basic human rights, that they're expendable, and that they shouldn't even exist. It's going to take a massive get out the vote mobilization and the unity of all people's movements, not just LGBTQ people, to make a difference this year. The women's movement, labor, youth, African-American, Asian-American, Latino, Latina, immigrant rights movements and others all have to be standing together before, during, and after the midterm elections. The takeaway slogan, uh, the takeaway lesson has to be that old labor slogan, an injury to one is an injury to all. Next slide. Now, I just want to close uh, with my last minute or so here with a quick word about the significance of tonight's meeting and, and CPUSA history. Uh, it, it's been noted in the past, both within the Communist Party and beyond its ranks, that as an organization, the CPUSA was behind the times when it came to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s movements uh, for gay and lesbian equality and later for LGBTQ equality. Uh, the Communist Party in recent years has made a lot of amends for its belated and, and delayed embrace of the LGBTQ community and its struggles. Many openly queer persons have developed politically and organizationally to take on leading roles in the party uh, and in the party press, including People's World. But the T, the T in LGBTQ equality was casually assumed to be covered under that umbrella commitment. Uh, but, but like Michael said in the beginning, uh, in reality, the party had not been fully grappling with the unique challenges and oppression of the trans community. And that was a shortcoming. And it be, when this became obvious after some trans comrades raised concerns about inadequate attentiveness to trans issues in the party's work, the national board moved quickly to set up uh, a committee. The three of us and others participated in that, uh, a committee to take a look at where the party might be lacking when it comes to understanding this struggle and, and finding ways for the membership to get involved. So this public meeting tonight, along with the resolution that was drafted by the committee uh, and adopted by the party, these are moments worth noting in the history of the US communist movement. This meeting tonight is a part of a process of correction and change. So everyone who's here uh, uh, participating tonight is, is really a part of something special. So we wanna say thank you for being here and for offering your suggestions and, and your help as we all grow together. Thanks very much and that, that uh, finishes off my section.
Okay, we'll open the floor for discussion. And uh, Shay and Michael can show their, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, thank you to our presenters. <clears throat> Very informative. If you'd like to introduce a question or make a comment, please uh, use your mouse cursor to click the picture of the hand, click the raised hand icon, open your mic on your end by clicking the picture of the mic, and we will open the your mic on uh, our end. So I'm now looking for raised hands for questions and uh, or comments. I'm looking for raised hands. You have to click the picture. You have to click the raise hand icon. Neil, you're there. You are. Uh, good evening. So, um, something that I'd be interested to knowing is that, well, one thing I appreciate is that you bring up how, at least in the electoral struggle trans issues, LGBT issues, and in general, sort of cultural war issues are used as a way to sort of distract the intention of voters from um, politicians' actions, even when said sort of issues that are raised to distract from other political and economic sort of ventures aren't necessarily organic as shown by the polls. So I'm interested in knowing how one can educate other people about the sort of mystified, I don't know how to call it, political, econ political economy sort of issues that are often hidden behind transphobia, anti-LGBT settlement, and so on. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. The the uh, format will be we'll take uh, as many of the comments and questions as we can. So looking for raised hands. Ismail, your mic is open. Here you are. Yes, in uh, many in this presentation and in others, uh, trans people are uh, normally pictured in uh, the uh, type of uh, maybe the fashion or the entertainment industry and here in fact you also uh, reference the uh, working in the uh, sex industry uh, what about uh, is there are there any statistics or any comments about uh, their work in other areas for example uh, in manufacturing or in in uh, I don't know in the in the construction trades or um, I mean are there other areas uh, uh, that reflect uh, the uh, uh, prejudice and the, the oppression of uh, trans people in other areas of work, and, and where are and where are they working? Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Oscar, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Click the mic. There you are. Hello. Um, I my my question's kind of just geared towards like, uh, I guess like when we speak about uh like trans issues and like the words that we use or and I and I I honestly believe like this could be applicable to a lot of things. But what got me thinking about this was in reference to uh, Leah Thomas's recent win in uh. I, I believe it was the 500 meter and someone was discussing it and they spoke as they spoke about it using the word controversy saying that like oh it was an event that sparked controversy and i i may be wrong on this and my question is basically just to kind of get what, what everyone's thoughts on this are but i personally find that like using the word controversy controversy in that instance is i, I feel as though it's like a little bit reductive and 
mainly because like when I hear the word controversy, I kind of think of just like a matter of like differing opinions. But to me, this seems like it's much more a matter of like not differing opinions, but like certain groups of people holding like views that are like harmful towards like marginalized groups and intolerant and et cetera. So I just kind of wanted to know what everyone's thoughts on that were. Thank you. Looking for a few more questions or comments. Looking for raised hands before we turn the mic. Okay. Jesus, uh, Jaime Diaz, open the mic on your end. Click the picture of the mic on your control panel with your mouse cursor and it will open. Click the picture. There you are. Speak up. There I am. Got it, figured out. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Carmen, for your presentation. Uh, when I think about trans women rights, right, the fight for equality, I wonder how you can connect that to reproductive rights, how the further marginalization of trans women in regard to reproductive rights. And you also mentioned critical race theory. I also think about like whiteness and, and privilege, right, and how, for example, uh, trans women of color, immigrant trans women of color, uh, how they're mistreated, right? And we have to continuously keep race at the front and center of, of such marginalization and, and stigma. So so thank you for your presentation. I, I really appreciated it. Okay, so let's turn the mic back over to our presenters, um, maybe in the order that you started, would that be suitable? And so they will, uh, our, our presenters will have the opportunity to respond to any and all questions and comments uh, for a about five minutes each and, and include please your closing remarks. So we'll start with Michael. Well, thank you everyone. And yeah, those are great questions. Um, I don't have answers for all of them. So I hope my other two comrades can maybe help where I, where I lack. Uh, but the first question that came up was how to teach others. Um, I don't consider myself an expert. And this stuff, you know, I'm a I'm a gay man. I feel like I learn every day from my trans comrades, from my trans friends in the ballroom community in New York City. And so I would say, you know, ask, reach out and ask people in the trans community. You know, just as if to learn about immigrant rights and the things that immigrants suffer. You know, you would reach out to immigrants too. Um, and so that's what I tend to do. Um, I think it's important in in terms of what I was saying about how um, black and brown. Uh, trans women, you know, of color in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, how they were sex workers. That's not a generalization. That's how many had to survive because they couldn't be hired anywhere else because there were not these anti-discriminatory laws uh, in place at the time. Now, today, I do not have the exact st uh, statistics, but in my circle of trans friends in the ballroom community, none of them are sex workers. None of them are current sex workers. They are waitresses. Um, they work in the in the factories, you know, at Amazon. Uh, they work, um, a few of them are mechanics and so forth. And so, you know, trans women are, they're women. They're, they're parts of our working class and they work any kind of jobs that we do. That is to say, they don't often, when they go to apply for a job, at least in, 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 in the situations that I'm aware of, they don't walk in and announce, you know, oh, I'm a trans woman. You know, they apply as a woman. And so maybe that's another reason why the data around this, uh, Shay probably knows more than me, but the data that I've looked into, it's kind of like spotty because, you know, a, a trans woman wants to live life as a woman. They don't want to go in and um, try to become a target of these possible attacks that can come uh, to them. Um, and then finally, in, in, in the, the case of the controversy uh, around, you know, uh, women, trans women athletes, you know, I feel like the mainstream media and the right wing, they make it a controversy by calling it a controversy. You know, and it's not a controversy. It's a controversy because you make it that. And so um, I think just as uh, our comrades back in the 20s and 30s uh, would have had to really deal with these issues surrounding racism and nationalism, you know, the, the, the party was founded by immigrants from East, uh, Eastern Europe. You know, there were sections organized, uh, you know, by the Lithuanians and the Poles and, and then later African-Americans and so forth. And so that had to be integrated. You know, people, our own comrades, the founders of the party, the, the charter members, they had to overcome, you know, these um, already held misconceptions of, uh, of race and gender and so forth. And we're continuing to do that, as CJ said, we made great advances. We made great advances, but the struggle continues um, internally as well. And so I hope that uh, we've all walked away from this presentation uh, knowing a little bit more than uh, what we did uh, when we started. And uh, we have to continue learning collectively. You know, this is an ongoing process. So thank you.
Uh, all right, excellent. Uh, so I'll start with number one about using um, trans issues as a cultural war issue and how to educate people about the political economy behind transphobia. Uh, so it, I think the answer to that is uh, it depends on if there is an actual like hidden economic agenda. So there's kind of like two things that are going on here, just like always. There's like extremists that like really just hate trans people. They may not have another agenda. They just want to see trans people die. That's like the Idaho ban on gender affirming care uh, was proposed to put people life in prison. Uh, then another, you know, another one of their Congress people there said it's not enough. We got to put the death penalty for for taking care of people, right? This was that's an extremist version. The mainstream people that are transphobic uh, passing these bills that are looking to hurt people. Uh, economically, like their purpose here is to use transphobia as a recruiting tool to pass their agenda or to keep from having to do anything about it. So it's not to me, you know, it's not lost to me that hundreds and you know, hundreds of bills have come out during the COVID pandemic when everybody's hurting, right? That seems like very well planned. Um, so it was a marriage of those two groups. So you have to kind of figure out what's going on locally. Uh, and the way you should educate yourself and others is to, of course, learn more and try to make friends with trans people and learn from them. Uh, hear trans people talk, uh, invite them to come and give talks to your groups. That works really well. Uh, the other part was about uh, work, about fashion, entertainment, sex work, uh, statistics of collecting statistics and stuff like that. It's going to vary wildly where you live. Like I live in the South and I don't have the same protections that Michael's uh, does in New York. Um, there is no LGBT protections down here. And it wasn't until December 2020 that the ban on civil rights protection happened, uh, ended finally. So we start getting some local ordinances. Uh, so sex work is still heavily prevalent. It's like extremely prevalent down here in the South. Um, but for people who do not do that, it's also dependent on race and class. Like, were you, you know, were your parents, you know, poor? If your parents were poor and you're trans, you're going to be even poorer than they are, regardless of your race. But when you add your race into it, then it's much worse. If your parents were not poor, then you probably went to college and you're probably doing something in a college career. Like, you know, I'm a nurse. So I know a lot of trans nurses. So programming, like IT jobs, are very popular for people who are able to go to college. Outside of that, if you don't can't do one or the other, a lot of trans people in the South work at Starbucks because they have excellent insurance for transgender people. I mean, a lot of trans people work at Starbucks. So if you want to find out where to meet people and you don't go to LGBT center, go to Starbucks. You'll find tons of trans people. Um, and we don't collect statistics on gender identity. They're just kind of left out. So it's it's extremely frustrating to find out this information is very difficult. Um, for the third question, it was about uh, the terms that we use. And that is a really good point. Um, one thing that I do for the surgeons and physicians that I educate uh, and that I work with is I point out how, they're, how they talk about trans people in research gets replicated uh, in law and how lawmakers use these degrading terms that came from medical researchers. And it is important to think about the way that we talk about them. And saying it's a controversy is correct. It's not a controversy. I refer to it as just politics because it's somebody's crappy politics that they're um, creating a controversy. It's not controversial that Leah Thomas won, you know, a, uh, you know, a swim meet. She's a swimmer. She's good at it. She's not the best, but that's not a controversy. What's controversial is making it a huge issue. Uh, and the last one is how can you connect uh, trans rights to reproductive rights? Uh, and that's also a really, really good question. Um, in, in general, transgender healthcare has a really um, like extremely dark history and it still has an extremely dark present. Uh, it was based off of a eugenics model and um, eugenics is still incredibly prevalent in the healthcare industry when it comes to transgender people. 
Um, so that's just like right there. It's it's at the baseline bottom of the fulcrum of reproductive rights. Um, a lot of the opposition to transgender healthcare from these extremists are based off of they don't want people to be uh, they want people to just be baby making machines. That's it to either give birth to kids or make you know impregnate people. That's all they care about, and so that's a very like core function of reproductive rights. Um, and the comment about you know making sure to keep race uh, at the front of um, of this issue, and I absolutely agree. That's a huge, huge, huge component. Um, transgender people of all races bear a massive burden, and we only talked about a tiny bit of it, but the full brunt of this terrible like capitalist society that we live in is faced off of by particularly indigenous and black trans women, and they need the most support. And um, it's not hard to get them the support that would make life better. It just requires a lot of political effort. Okay, uh, yeah, some, some very good questions and some great answers already. So I'll just limit myself to a couple of points. Um, on the first question, I think it was from Neil about, uh, you know, how do, how do you talk about these issues? How do you educate people on the, the political economy? Uh, that's hidden behind anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans uh, efforts and legislation. You know, I think we can think we can think about this along the same lines that we do when we talk about uh, race oppression, women's oppression, all forms, different kinds of forms of special oppression. You know, one thing capitalism does is that it excels at dividing people and using that division uh, and that special oppression techniques. Uh, to do that. The more wedges you can put into the working class, the better if, if you're a part of the ruling class. If you want to stop unions, you want to stop a social spending bill, you want to prevent uh, someone from blocking your war spending bill, you want to stop the minimum wage increase, if you want to do any of these things, uh, then you need to stop people from uniting. And, and that's something that capitalism is very good at. Because when you can divide people, stop them from uniting, you can oppress them easier. Now, we're talking about this in terms of the working class and political economy of capitalism. We have to also keep in mind, you know, when we're looking for allies to fight some of these things, a lot of these, these different uh, forms of special oppression, they have cross-class effects, right? Uh, women of all classes are affected by anti-woman legislation. Uh, people of color, no matter their class, uh, can be affected by racist legislation. And, and the same comes to this. You know, a lot of these anti-trans bills, even though on the surface they're, they're targeting what might look like, you know, a small percentage of the overall population, they have effects that can go beyond and, and affect everybody. So uh, that's one way to talk about this. You know, our tool is solidarity. Uh, and just like it is in, in other areas of struggle, uh, you know, in the fight against racism, white workers have to be key, key leaders and voices in, in battling racism. Uh, when it comes to the struggle for LGBTQ equality, straight allies have to be key voices in talking about these things. It can't just be those communities themselves that have to bear that burden. And the same comes when we're talking about the, strength, the trans uh, uh, struggle for justice and equality. Uh, cisgender allies and comrades have to be standout voices uh, for this. That unity, that, that's, that's the key that we have, and I think we can talk about this, these forms of oppression, the political economy behind it in those kind of terms. Think about what capitalism does, and think about what is our tool for fighting back. Uh, last point I'll say is on, on that question about you know, uh, controversy. And as, as both Shay and Mike, Michael said, you know, these are only controversies because they're, they're made into controversies. Uh, I just think back to some of those poll numbers I was showing from swing states. You know, by and large, a lot of people have an instinct for justice. Uh, they don't support these, these kind of measures, these kind of hateful and ignorant attacks. Uh, but they do, these kind of attacks do appeal to a particular uh, segment of the voting population. And, and that's what Republicans and the right wing are doing. They are pandering to that group to mobilize it, to turn it out in higher percentages than they actually represent uh, in, in the working class and in the American public. So. Uh, what we have to do is, is be mobilizing our side, educating more and more people around us to, to, to the, the importance of these issues, help them to understand uh, why, why they matter, 
also to them, even if they themselves are not trans, are not women, are not gay or lesbian, whatever it might be, right? Uh, we have to drive home how these 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 attacks affect everybody. And uh, I think I think that that's yeah, that's my last word on on the topic. So. All right. So on behalf of uh, all of our participants uh, tonight. Uh, I'd like to extend our deepest appreciation for the work that you all put into uh, this uh, class tonight. It was very evident that you did a lot of work and you uh, provided us with uh, important information that we should be able to share with, uh, with everyone. Um, so I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for the work you did. I think it will produce beautiful results uh, in the near and far future. So thank you and thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a beginning and the struggle continues. So good night. Thank you. Excellent.